Take it away, Kevin. Thank you, Nina. Hi, everybody. Welcome aboard. It's great to see everybody from everywhere around the world today for another great AIM webinar. This time we'll be talking about enabling end to end business process automation with intelligent document processing. Now, exactly what is intelligent document processing or IDP and what makes it so intelligent? We'll learn more today, but according to Gartner, intelligent document processing uses natural language technologies to extract data from structured and unstructured content, especially from documents to support process automation and augmentation. And with demands for hyper automation in today's workplace on the rise, IDP is an important first step in transforming business information and content from different sources and different formats into usable data for any number of downstream processes. So what role should information management pros play with intelligent document processing and how can we leverage IDP for process improvement? That's what we'll be exploring today. We'll learn how to identify the manual inputs and interventions that could benefit from IDP, determine how pre-processing actions to uh, determine pre-processing actions to ensure accuracy and processing at scale, how to set document classification parameters for correct extraction and indexing, and how to validate the processing storage and retention of information for downstream use uh, in other applications. So it should be a great panel of guests today and a great discussion. So let's get into it with our first two guests tonight. Joining us today are Petra Beck and Ralph Gammon from InfoSource. Petra and Ralph, are you with us? I um, see you coming. Yes. Uh, there you are. <laughs> All right, Petra and Ralph are both senior analysts with InfoSource software. They are here to help us understand what is IDP and what role does it play in end-to-end -end automation. So Petra and Ralph, please tell us more. What are your perspectives? Okay, thanks, Kevin. I'm going to get started. And then, uh, yeah, if we want to uh, start the presentation. And, and yeah, I guess the goal is here to, to talk about IDP, yes. And, and kind of and really our goal is to really provide everyone here um, with background, okay? So what is IDP? I mean, it's, it, it's you know, I'll get into it to our perspective, um, but I also want to then kind of, you know, set the field for the, the sponsors that follow so they can kind of talk about where their kind of uh, applications fit into this evolving IDP market. So just real brief, the agenda here that I'm gonna cover is, um, yeah, we're gonna start with a, uh, Kind of a history of okay so, so where did idp come from um i mean it's it's a term that started showing up i think uh probably less than five years ago on, on everyone's radar and it's it's going to be very important uh, uh going forward in in this market that uh you know we had i guess historically called content services uh we're going to talk about how idp is kind of affecting the, the vendor ecosystem and, and how you know, a uh, you know, bunch of new vendors in the market talk about kind of where they fit. Then I'm going to pass over to Petra. She's going to talk about some of the dynamics that we're seeing in this overall content services and enterprise software market and how that is kind of helping shape the evolution of this IDP market. And we're going to finish off uh, with some, some of our predictions, some of our visions for uh, where IDP is, is headed in the future. And, and I think we're already seeing some uh, kind of some next level IDP stuff out there on the market that are pretty cool. We'll, we'll try and leave about five minutes at the end uh, for any questions uh, that you might have. So um, yeah, hopping on to the, uh, the next slide here. Uh, yeah, I mean, info sources. So who are we? We've always kind of been the, uh, the guys that cover the, the capture software market. I mean, this coverage goes back uh, to our roots with, a, with HSA probably, you know, back at, at least 20 years. Um, so what is the capture market? You know, let's just start with the definition of that. And it's really, if you see that definition, it's really uh, focused on the conversion of unstructured input from multiple sources into data that can be utilized by computer systems. We're basically taking this unstructured information to turn it into bits and bytes. Um, you know, these unstructured sources started out as mostly paper. 
Uh, still a lot of documents but over the years, accelerated by the pandemic, we've seen shift to more electronic inputs and Petra's kind of a little more uh, details on this uh, later in the uh, presentation. And, and for years, capture software is a healthy space growing, you know, eight, nine, 10, every now and then don't jump up into the low uh, double digits growth. So it's, it's been a steady growth, you know, between five, $6 billion a year right now worldwide. Um, so, you know, not a bad, bad market to be in. Uh, so then, so, so kind of, so what have we seen recently in relation to capture that's kind of set the uh, stage for the development of IDP? I mean, if you go back even before 2016, uh, as a lot of you, if you've been associated with AIM, you realize, I mean, the, the original driver for a lot of ECM and capture was this idea of, of records management. You know, you, you take your paper documents, it's, it's more, efficient, uh, a better operation to store them electronically, better able to find them. But, you know, as we kind of started moving forward, uh, we started to see, okay, well, well, kind of, you know, how can we, we really increase our ROI? What's the most efficient use of this technology? And a lot of that had to do with uh, kind of deploying OCR and, uh, and capture technologies uh, kind of ahead of the records management process, getting into areas like case management, accounting, processing invoices, uh, processing claims, all that type of stuff, moving that forward. And, and that's where you start to really see some hard ROIs and it's, you're able to get capture processes or capture projects funded uh, with those ROIs. Just a, a note, records management is still very important. So, so everyone involved with information governments, we've just seen it deployed a, a lot more in combination with case management and accounting applications. Uh, so it's kind of done after the fact, but really, we really track is the primary reason for purchasing uh, capture. Okay, so that's capture. So what did um, uh, capture, how did capture lead to, uh, to IDP? And so us, it, it all started out, I mean, you know, if you go back to the late 1990s, we started out coming out with this stuff called uh, advanced or intelligent capture. And the first application of it was, uh, Invoices, right? And, and invoice processing uh, now probably you know one of one of the killer apps in uh, for capture and IDP technologies. And basically, what the big advancement was was going from the processing of structured forms. Uh, Marcus started with started out with a lot of uh, forms like tax forms. Uh, uh, health claims forms like HICVA, as we used to call them, surveys, all that type of stuff where the same information shows up in the, in the same spot. So you can draw templates and process these, you know, same type of forms over and over. Well, well an invoice is not like that, right? If you're all familiar with invoices and, uh, you know, the guys from Docstar are going to talk about this later, I'm, I'm sure. But uh, an invoice is, comes from, you know, it, it's all, they all contain basically the same information. I mean, there's a date, there's a vendor, there's an amount, there might be line items, but it can show up depending on the accounting system and the vendor that created it, uh, the information can show up in different places on the documents. So you really had to start to apply a, a little bit of intelligence to, uh, you know, you couldn't just draw boxes. So, uh, you know, that market was kind of introduced. It, it really started taking off when we saw integration with ERP systems. Uh, and, and, and then, okay, so invoice processing, kind of the first intelligent capture application we had out there. By the mid 2000s, we started to see uh, kind of some more intelligence introduced into uh, capture. And a lot of this was kind of early use. This was machine learning. This was AI on some level, except for nobody used the term back then because uh, I think everyone saw the Terminator and were scared to, to, to use AI. But obviously we've gotten over that now. Uh, this was a lot of this stuff, did, did stuff like cluster, uh, you know, documents together that, that look similar. So you could kind of do sorting. You, you could use it to eliminate separator sheets. Uh, mortgage files would come in. You, you could kind of, if there was, was like a hundred different types of, of documents within a complex mortgage file, you might be able to sort those, those all out. That was kind of uh, what we started to see, you know, for pr probably you know, that took 10 years and it was slowly adopted. I mean, we still had a lot of traditional uh, legacy structured forms capture and, and invoices going on out there. But then we did start to see some more advancement, you know, more of the, this uh, advanced or intelligent capture. And about, uh, you know, 2016, 2017, we, we really started to see this trend of this market of people who had roots in, in AI. And, you know, some of this had to do with uh, uh, more cloud computing power. You could run these AI algorithms. Uh, there, there were more of them being made available through open source and, and and they were really looking for some place to kind of apply their AI technology and um, yeah, uh, 
what do you know? There was a cap. They saw the capture market as an opportunity. They saw a lot of uh, unstructured, semi-structured forms that were not touched by current uh, capture applications. So it really became one of the first areas where AI kind of rubber hit the road. Uh, this led to a, a lot of uh, capital being uh, invested. We saw more uh, VC money, I think, invested in, in about a five-year period or even maybe even narrowed down to a three-year period uh, than we'd seen in the whole history of capture uh, multiple times over. So, uh, and, and then RPA vendors started getting into the mix because they were doing, uh, they were kind of doing capture from structured uh, computer systems and moving it to another one or moving it to from one computer system to another. So, so unstructured documents and the application IDP kind of became a natural for them. And then finally, we see we've even seen the traditional capture vendors who were already, like I said, I mean, they were already using AI and machine learning. Uh, so they started adding IDP functionality to their applications, which has, you know, kind of created the IDP market uh, as we have it now. So if you want to flip to the next slide. So, so how do we define IDP? A slide on the right is, is from the movie adaptation. For some reason, I always kind of... Uh, <laughs> envision all these AI guys maybe sitting around at a seminar, someone came out with a white paper on, on, on how to apply AI to IDP and, and, and suddenly we've got a couple hundred more companies in this market. But uh, what, is, what does it do? It really introduces AI and machine learning heavy duty into what we have traditionally known as, as capture applications. A lot of this is used for classification and extraction. Uh, it, it has enabled us to, to onboard more unstructured documents into capture processes. Uh, there's really a, a learn by example approach to this. Uh, you know, the, the capture has been notorious for years and years, big setup times. You had to run multiple, you know, multiple months of, of trials before going live. I mean, a lot of this stuff, uh, you know, the, the developers, the, um, the, yeah, the, the vendors do the work behind the scenes and they want to set it up to, to be more of a low code, no code uh, type of interface and enable business analysts to kind of come in and, and lay these out. So basically you're, you're running a document through, you're, you're marking the, the data you want and, and it's getting captured. Then you keep running it through when there's uh, exceptions and, and it increases, it's got uh, learned by example, it, it has some intelligence, enables it to improve over time. Uh, one another trend there's really no focus on scanning which is, is kind of different from the traditional capture market uh, there's a lot of AI algorithms that can be used to improve uh, uh, images and, and a lot of these you know these AI the uh, IDP vendors the strict IDP vendors will just say you know we, we'll just pick it up from a watch folder and process it from there as we start to see more mobile uh, show up more, more images captured over mobile this becomes an important uh, an important uh, you know, what qualification or important uh, feature to have. Uh, and, and really, like I said, there's been, our, our market went from about 30 to 40 companies worldwide that ma that matter to, to probably uh, several hundred. And, and uh, you know, even have hyperscalers like Google, Amazon, they've all gotten, Microsoft, they've all gotten into the mix. And uh, yeah, I think I talked about those, those other dynamics um, previously. But then, so, so at the, the end of the day, what does IDP do? I mean, from our standpoint, it really improves traditional capture. I mean, if you look at it, it improves the usability, reduces the setup times, as I talked about. Uh, Low-code, no-code interfaces are, 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 are a valuable thing that they kind of bring, uh, uh, you know, bring the, the, the non-coders into the mix for deploying this stuff. Extends use cases into a lot of documents, uh, unstructured type documents. Uh, I mean, some of the stuff uh, that we've seen is, you know, you might have had a... a a business analyst that was going through complex financial reports and, and capture technology couldn't touch that previously. Well, now you might not get perfection with that, but you might be able to get uh, 80, 90 percent and you know reduce the, the labor from uh, you know an hour to 20 minutes, that type of stuff. Uh, there's really a couple of potential outcomes that IDP vendors and, and people using IDP talk about. I mean, one is this goal straight through processing, so that's adding enough intelligence. Uh, to kind of eliminate exceptions and, and, and go end to end. And as I mentioned, kind of the other use case is this idea of human in the loop, which we used to call a key entry, um, is now able to uh, yeah, just reduce the uh, reduce knowledge workers interactions uh, uh, with, with some complex documents. And IDP are kind of neat. It's been a proving ground uh, for AI, as I mentioned. Uh, we're now seeing all this kind of this chat uh, technology come online. Well, really, I mean, we've had we've had AI in uh, in uh, capture IDP for you know three or four years now, and uh, yeah, and, and 
you know, it's, it, it's really proven, okay, this stuff does work in business applications and now it's, it's going more broad. So let's take a look uh, real quickly at the vendor landscape here. Now, how has the, the ecosystem evolved? Uh, what does it look like now since IDP is introduced? I mean, obviously you, you look at, at the, the SDKs and toolkits. I mean, that was always Abby and, and, you know, Cofax, of course, and, uh, you know, I, I guess Periscript still has a, uh, is a legacy vendor in that area. Uh, but you also have now vendors like Amazon, Google, Microsoft that are offering kind of uh, tools that you, you use, recognition tools that can be used uh, as building blocks. A company like Verify, they're a straight IDP uh, cloud startup that offers uh, receipt processing to uh, expense management uh, applications. So, so it's, it's increased the market in that area. So, 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 so that's kind of at the top. And then next kind of you have this... Uh, this, these are kind of the guys that you, a lot of, you know, with an aim background, these guys are probably what you're most familiar with. These are, you know, you see the, the pure play capture vendors uh, and the ECM vendors and, uh, you know, a lot of crossover between the two of them, of course, you know, open text, of course, is a pure play capture as well as an ECM vendor. Uh, you know, this is a lot of the, the familiar names, market leaders like, like Abby and Kofax, and, and these guys still control the majority of the market, but always, we've always had, and then, you know, tangentially to these guys, you've always had kind of the enterprise software and the more specialized um, P2P players, uh, kind of the guys that specialize in um, in invoice automation. Uh, you know, these guys have always kind of had traditional capture, but they're now starting to launch uh, IDP applications. I mean, Oracle, of course, bought Captivation years ago, but now they have an IDP application for processing invoices. So it's really kind of a, a yeah, a, a emerging, uh, it's always been kind of a, a complex mix, but, but uh, you know, the addition of, and if you just wanted the, the, these last kind of, you've got these, you know, the latest vendors in the market are these RPA and IDP guys. And these are a lot of the guys that have gotten a lot of the funding. These are the startups. These are, I mean, the RPA guys are obviously very well funded and have these big footprints for automation in RPA and are trying to expand now into what we've called, you know, capture and IDP and, and, and of course the IDP guys. But the interesting thing is now, you know, we put this in a circle because IDP really gets very close to pure play capture. Um, the one interesting point that I will make is none of the pure play capture guys have acquired really any IDP software, which I find interesting. Of course, now as some of this funding starts to dry up and, and uh, you know, with just because of uh uh, overall economic dynamics, uh, we may see some more of that consolidation activity, but uh, uh, most of the pure play guys on the right have really kind of introduced their own IDP technology because as, as I mentioned earlier, they really were in machine learning and AI previous to, to a lot of these IDP vendors uh, launching their um, launching their thing. So finally, the well, one project we're working on now and we're about to release is our, our annual ranking of capture vendors. Uh, here's kind of a preview. This is kind of the first public uh, showing of this. Uh, if you want to take a look at it, I um, mean, you can see, as, as I mentioned, really a, a lot of the traditional capture vendors are still uh, kind of uh, on the right-hand side. That's because th they do have a, uh, you know, kind of a strong market share and, and they have invested in IDP technology to kind of maintain that market share. Uh, and then if you look though, you do see a lot of the, uh, you know, in the uh, disruptor category, you see a lot of the, you uh, you know, kind of the, these these startups, kind of the, the guys that have, uh, you know, cloud technology that are really kind of trying to, uh, uh, you know, leverage IDP to really disrupt the market. Uh, but you also have, you know, a, a, a higher execution type companies that, the, you know, Automation Anywhere obviously is a huge install base, for instance, of um, RPA customers, and, and they're trying to introduce IDP to, to come after what we have traditionally known as the capture market. And then, of course, you have, uh, strong companies, you know, uh, UST, Planet AI that are exploring the market are investing heavily in this, have some innovative technology, just haven't quite established the uh, the market base. And, and just to be clear, this is just a, a rating of 20 vendors that we see as leaders, um, you know, really have innovative technology or, or some exceptionally large footprints. I mean, there are, you know, as I mentioned, a, a couple hundred vendors out there in the market really vying for this uh, capture and IDP space. So really exciting, uh, dynamic time to be in the market. I'm going to hand over to Petra right now, who's going to talk about some of the, uh, you know, give you some specifics on those dynamics in the market and, uh, you know, how we see everything, everything moving forward in, in terms of IDP and capture. 
Thank you so much, uh, Ralph. So now I'm going to take um, a look out into the future and look at uh, market dynamics that are going to influence uh, the IDP uh, market and the potential uh, in the uh, IDP market and also the changing uh, requirements from an end uh, customer perspective for the next couple of years. Now, starting with the growing interest in end-to-end -end, um, process automation, this is, of course, um, what this webinar is, is all about and we'll see um, interest examples from uh, from the vendors um, uh, later on um, and how they are going to enable that next step at least towards end-to-end um, -end process automation. Now um, closely um, interlinked uh, with that is of course um, the desire to reduce manual um, interventions, um, mon mundane tasks uh, that uh, um, take up a lot of time of, uh, of knowledge workers, of uh, subject matter um, experts, the desire to achieve the straight through processing that um, Ralph mentioned mentioned um, earlier, um, and um, also the uh, the growing number of business um, inputs, the, the need to go beyond uh, the traditional um, uh, transactional um, inputs uh, like, uh, like documents into um, newer type of text and, uh, and non-text actually um, input. So we'll take a look at um, data for that uh, in a moment. Um, uh, here, a scalability of, uh, of solutions. I think the need for that, um, a lot of enterprises have learned this, unfortunately, the hard way during the pandemic uh, when they weren't able to scale um, uh, solutions up and down as they um, needed. And uh, Ralph already um, mentioned it, the, uh, the non-coders, uh, the desire um, for the business um, to do um, configuration um, and uh, maybe even set up solutions um, without relying on IT and IT also um, obviously being um, challenged uh, with, with a shortage of uh, resources. Now let's take a look at some data um, for, um, for all of those. So Starting with, and I uh, had already mentioned the capture to, uh, to repository, the, uh, the primary reason um, uh, for capture uh, being focused on more records management type applications. So here I brought you some data that uh, shows um, a significant decline here during uh, the pandemic and a significant growth here in anything we um, bundled together as um, capture to, uh, to business um, a process. Now up here we see um, IDP integrated uh, with RPA. Um, we see um, and we'll get to the maturity phases of, uh, of capture and IDP later on. We see a growing convergence of, uh, of these two. Now we would argue that um, IDP um, in the narrow sense um, are actually these um, two upper areas. Now let's double click on those and uh, take a look at, um, at the respective uh, use cases. We do group them um, for this purpose in um, three um, larger um, groups, so starting with accounting, um, and I'd like to double click on that. Now, um, Ralph already talked about um, invoice um, processing and uh, the importance uh, from a legacy perspective. Um, we do see still um, a significant opportunity there um, as it expands to um, more of an end-to-end -end automation of um, accounting processes. So the procure to pay, the order uh, to cash um, aspect of that. When we look at um, the, uh, the middle um, element here, and I double clicked on uh, that um, as well. So um, we do see in case management, firstly, uh, the largest um, growth opportunity going forward. Um, and uh, uh, this is because onboarding um, is the largest use case there, and that's um, relevant for literally um, all, um, all enterprises and also the public sector um, and claims management um, also being a significant opportunity for automating um, in the insurance space. And I think uh, Papyrus Software is going to take us through um, a detailed um, use case that will highlight uh, the opportunities in this space. Now, the third um, uh, part here, so this is 
other um, capture and IDP use cases, um, including CM. I think CM is a term that we'll see um, a lot more prominently um, going forward. This is customer experience uh, management. It means the, um, the stronger role um, that the contact center um, plays as an additional um, channel um, for transactional um, business inputs. And talking about um, uh, the different types of, uh, of input and I mentioned omnichannel earlier. I brought you this visual that shows very um, clearly that uh, during the pandemic, um, the paper-based um, uh, documents um, declined, a trend that was already um, underway, um, but accelerated um, significantly and is here to stay. So we will see a lot more digital document types, but we also see a lot more um, other um, uh, types of inputs like photos, like um, voice and, uh, and video coming into uh, play. And um, we believe that there's a significant um, additional opportunity um, there. We very much um, InfoSource um, uh, subscribes to the view um, that um, a, a fully automated um, ingestion of business inputs or capture IDP, um, uh, regardless of how you want to, uh, to call it, um, involves um, these uh, different types of inputs and the different uh, channels. And I did bring you uh, this visual that we use a lot to explain the scope um, that we uh, see for, and this is why we call it capture and IDP, stretching the, the D in IDP um, to go beyond um, documents as uh, future opportunities. I also mentioned scalability, so I want to highlight um, hosted um, capture solutions here that have um, uh, come into play in the capture world um, relatively late, only in the last two to three um, years. So two, two reasons really, um, the newer, the AI-based uh, vendors, um, they uh, tend to offer their uh, solutions um, purely as, uh, as cloud-based solutions. Uh, we also see an increase increasing um, interest um, in subscriptions, um, anything that's not cloud-based, that's not hosted, um, we, um, we see um, uh, that as um, becoming more important again with the idea to have that additional flexibility and scalability. And we do um, expect a significant increase um, in hosted um, capture uh, services for the next couple of years. So we did promise you um, to uh, give you a, a little vision of where Capture and IDP are going um, in the next uh, couple of years. Now, I would like to do this by looking at automation um, levels. And I have here, I have um, four automation um, levels that take us from um, very uh, simple um, uh, document uh, scanning only, digitization only, um, all the way um, to end-to-end -to -end, um, automation of an entire um, business transaction. And this is actually cross uh, departments. Um, so of course, it's a continuum, but uh, for the sake of, uh, um, of, of visualization here, um, I, I did um, split it into these um, four different levels. And of course, there's a, a fifth one um, here, which is completely manual um, processing. So we assume uh, that about um, at least a third, uh, we would say, of um, processes that have an opportunity um, to be automated lies uh, still in this um, in this phase zero. So still in planning um, has not been um, uh, really initiated. So number one, um, as I said, pure digitization, um, basic capture as, uh, as we would um, uh, call it. Um, so we assume that also um, still about um, 20 to 25 percent um, of, uh, of the solutions um, out there um, are still in, the, in this phase. Now, number, um, number two here, uh, this is what we would describe as the starting point of advanced capture, of intelligent capture, of IDP. So here we are capturing to a business application. Um, classification comes into uh, play. 
and now we are taking it um, one step um, further. Uh, and this now includes, and uh, the little robot here is uh, there for obviously for a reason, but not limited to RPA, um, starting integration with RPA solutions, with BPM um, uh, solutions um, to take um, the automation uh, one step um, further or even start um, earlier in the process. And then finally, um, this is what we um, expect to be um, the, uh, the desirable um, end stage here. As I said, the cross-departmental end-to-end um, automation. Um, we also believe that this involves um, omni-channel capture all um, incoming um, business inputs being processed automatically with a human in the loop where this um, makes sense, of course, um, uh, seamlessly, uh, really. So um, a couple of things uh, to conclude here. Uh, we would describe um, steps um, two to five um, as uh, the IDP type um, uh, steps um, of, of the um, uh, automation uh, level. Um, what it also uh, shows, because most of the current solutions are here, some of the, the advanced uh, vendors are starting to move um, over, over here, and very few are actually in step uh, four. Um, and the uh, demand from the market is going to shift uh, from left to right. So um, in conclusion, there is still a lot of opportunity out there. Uh, the uh, market is still in a relatively early um, stage of maturity. I think we have left a few minutes for Q&A. Very good. Thank you. That is Petra Beck and Ralph Gammon from InfoSource. Petra and Ralph, thank you for your comments today. Um, we do have some questions. And indeed, if you have questions for Petra and Ralph, now would be the time to go ahead and pose them in the Q&A feature. We will try to get them into uh, this segment as we have uh, Ralph and Petra with us. Um, Ralph and Petra, I noticed during your presentation today that you've used the term capture and IDP almost interchangeably. Um, and I wanna make sure that we're understanding the difference between the two, or is, is there a difference really between the two? Is capture really the beginning and IDP really the end of one big continuum of uh, technologies and approaches? Or how do you differentiate or distinguish between capture and IDP? Yeah, I'll, I'll start and, and I'll say yes. we. Um... You know, we kind of view the the or the implementation of AI and machine learning, you know, heavy duty AI machine learning into the capture process. We kind of look at IDP as a subset of capture. I mean, capture to us is a big, broad uh, type of thing. It can involve multi-channel, it can involve video, it can involve audio. I mean, traditionally, it has involved a lot of documents. IDP uh, right now seems to be focused on documents, uh, but it's really the use of AI and machine learning algorithms to do extraction and classification. That, that's kind of the kind of the, the where it's at right now. Um, some of the stuff that, that Petra showed with, with AI being used downstream to automate uh, you know, workflows and, and straight through processing. I mean, that starts to get uh, you know, into a little more advanced automation of business processes, uh, crossover with IDP, uh, yeah, more of a future vision. And, um, you know, we, I just want to say we did uh, publish, recently publish a white paper discussing these differences that will be available through a link that AIM is going to be distributing along with the assets to this, uh, to this webinar. Fair enough. Um, I know there was some chat uh, questions or discussion going on for a uh, time there about the term pure play capture. And Antonia uh, is asking, you know, what is pure play capture? What do you mean by that? And how do we fit it into the continuum of IDP? I mean, to us, pure play capture is, um, yeah, I mean, if you're just, if, you, if you're not necessarily focused on, on workflow, workflow or ECM, or you don't have an ERP application, I mean, you're really focused on, on you know, the, this front end of, you um, you know, there, there's a, a lot of the, the vendors we showed were the traditional capture vendors, the vendors like Abby, Kofax, OpenTix, the guys that have these, uh, you know, uh, multi-million uh, page per year type document processing applications set up in, 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 in the main 
the main goal is the capture part of it. Now, IDP is can be absolutely be applied as part of this, but somehow you have to have be able to control the onboarding and control the, the multi-channel inputs. And a lot of the IDP stuff is just more focused on the on the classification and, and extraction. Right. Petra, did you want to add to that at all? Yeah, I would say uh, don't take it literally. Um, it's there. There are probably very few um, true pure play um, capture vendors. We just uh, when when Ralph um, showed the visual, uh, these are the ones that have probably the strongest uh, focus on uh, on capture. Uh, but uh, there's no such thing. I would uh, almost say as as a true pure play um, uh, capture right. vendor these days. This question comment coming in from Carlos, the most advanced point that Petra describes in the levels of automation, in what scenario do you imagine these processes? I don't imagine that document structure, uh, that document structured but completed by hand can accept processing fully automatically without manual correction, or is there an operational formula for that concept? Petra? <laughs> So I did mention um, that uh, when we when we talk about end-to-end -end, um, automation, we mentioned uh, straight-through processing. Um, that um, gets applied obviously when when it makes sense. So, for example, in the insurance claims um, uh, sector, that would be insurance uh, claims in the in the, uh, uh, in the PNC sector, in the auto um, sector that are. Um, simpler straightforward um, probably lower lower value um etc uh, we we definitely um mm -hmm. see and i did mention it i believe uh, that there is um uh, there will be an element of um, human in the loop there will be an element of um of yeah checking on validation um important uh important aspects that uh that need to need an extra approval because um the uh, the amount is uh, such that it that it should uh, the discounts are involved uh, for example uh, that do require um a human to uh, to check uh, certain okay. things but anything that's um more of a, a mundane uh, task anything that can validate it uh, can be validated and augmented from information that sits in these legacy systems, um, uh, that is definitely a okay. candidate. But we are far away from uh, right. from that actually being being the standard or, or being um, a larger okay. part of, of solutions in the market. All right, very good. That is Petra Beck and Ralph Gammon from InfoSource Software. Thank you, Petra. Thank you, Ralph, for being part of our event today. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. All right, very good. Well, we are moving on. We do have questions and comments coming in on both the chat and the Q&A. Please keep it up, everyone. We love it when you're involved. Uh, for those that questions we didn't get to, we will be putting everyone in touch. But for now, let's move ahead to our next two presenters today, Dean Hillary and Eric McCracken. Are you both with us, Dean and Eric? Yes, we are. Coming on board, I see you, gentlemen. Hey, hello, Very everyone. good, Dean Hillary. Welcome on board. Dean is the Enterprise Content Manager, uh, Management Territory Manager for uh, DocStar, and joining him also is Eric McCracken, Territory Account Manager for DocStar. They are both here to talk with us about transforming business documents and content into electronic information assets. What do you mean by that, Dean and Eric? And tell us more. Sure, be glad to. And thanks everybody for joining us today. So uh, just a quick overview and then I'm going to turn it over to Eric. So as far as myself, I've been in the uh, imaging and content management business world for about 25 plus years. Uh, interesting enough, I started out on the capture side, really for large format engineering drawings and then moved into present day, which is business documents, which is our focus today. Eric, why don't you do your intro and then I'll let you kick off our initial slide. Sure thing. Thanks, Dean. Uh, so good day, everyone. My name's Eric McCracken. I'm a territory manager for DocStar. I'm based in uh, West Palm Beach, Florida. I cover the southeastern U.S. and Caribbean for DocStar. And um, so for context, uh, DocStar actually fits kind of in that purple bubble that uh, Ralph was presenting earlier today. Uh, where we incorporate both IDP and ECM or process automation technologies. 
So um, again, welcome to our presentation. Dean and I are gonna talk about transforming your business documents and content into electronic information assets with a focus on leveraging the IDP technology as a key driver. So why are businesses of all sizes attracted to IDP technology? As part of our own market research effort, we commissioned the consulting firm Level Research to survey a number of companies from SMB to large enterprise uh, across a variety of verticals who were considering IDP technology. This survey yielded some really interesting information. Uh, there were a large number of drivers that, that we found, uh, but we selected the top seven to address in this session. So uh, at the top was uh, time consuming manual data entry. This was by far the most common driver. I can tell you in my own experience, I've, I've been in this industry for uh, over 12 years and I've helped uh, hundreds of clients uh, automate uh, their various document driven business processes. And I frequently hear examples along the lines of how firms uh, hire highly paid professionals, such as degreed accountants, with pure intentions of, of leveraging their skills to perform these higher level analytical tasks for them. But they do frequently get derailed into assuming primary responsibility for uh, the, the more mundane day-to-day -day tasks that, that have to be dealt with such as data entry of inbound vendor invoices or other accounting data. Um, next is data entry errors. So, you know, we humans aren't perfect and, and we can be prone to error from time to time, especially when we're under pressure to meet deadlines or distracted with other priorities. And then next is that manual stare and compare process. So frequently the same individual whose responsibility it is to get the data into the system is also responsible for validating that data against another data source. So such as a, a vendor invoice matching it to a, a purchase order or an inbound customer PO to the line items in your uh, pricing file in your ERP system. And then uh, next would be fraud uh, prevention and compliance. So this was another popular driver uh, where taking that human element out of the data capture component can help shore up adhering to various compliance standards, uh, whether they be financial, governmental, or peer group compliances. So we have a few more on the list. I'm gonna hand it back over to Dean and he's gonna cover the rest of these for us. Sure, thanks, Eric. So uh, part of the survey uh, was also focused on AP automation. So the next few kind of tie into that. So kind of a down the road benefit after the initial savings on manual data entry, is in this case for AP automation is capturing early payment discounts, being able to have all that information available to you at your fingertips, streamline the business process in order to help capture those discounts. So that's that definitely adds to the ROI. You know, when we talk about lost misfiled documents, that really correlates back to paper. There, there's still a, a great percentage of customers out there that their information assets, there's still a large percentage that are still paper-based. So the lost misfiled documents really ties into the pain of still dealing with paper information. Of course, once it's in electronic format, it can be accounted for much more easily. And then the last one on this list really about duplicate document detection. So, you know, one of the values of a good IDP type of solution is being able to understand that it actually just processed a document maybe a couple of days ago or up to 30 days ago and minimize the duplicate document detection of reprocessing the same document again because somebody submitted it twice. So that, that's kind of an interesting uh, value prop for, uh, for this process. So what I'd like to do now is touch on how does IDP help? So uh, Eric and I are gonna approach this from two points. I'm gonna start first. And if you look at the diagram below, uh, it's kind of the process we like to say about input, process, and output. So uh, we know everybody's talked about capture a little bit today. So uh, I'm gonna start off on that and then turn it over to Eric to talk about the process. And then I'll kick back in at the end of this slide and talk about the output. So if you look at the title up at the top, we say 
decentralized capture. Well, geez, what do we mean by that? Well, you know, years ago, it was all about bringing the paper to the process, bringing the paper to a centralized scanning room or capture area, whatever that uh, format might be. But, but, you know, with today's technology, especially with scanners and office equipment, copiers, being able to scan and so forth, we've actually brought the process to the paper so that people can capture the paper where it actually exists. So scanners are absolutely an important part in today's capture technology for the paper aspect of it. And then looking at, you know, IDP with its input, you can set up these processes to help, uh, regardless of the type of scanner that you want to use, be able to input that document and get it into an electronic asset. So the other side for email and folders, well, those are assumed they're already in an electronic asset. And by the way, email, especially when you're dealing with external to your company and documents coming in to be processed, that's a real big one. And, you know, I have customers out there that say, you know, we're doing a great job. You know, 90% of our documents are coming in via email. But when I ask them what they do next, they're actually opening their emails, they're printing them out, and they're distributing paper documents again. So part of the IDP process is to minimize the ingestion of those documents, the actual labor to get those in the system. So obviously for scanning, yes, you're gonna be actually manually scanning. If you're doing email and network folders that already have electronic documents, the goal is there, you minimize the touch points for scanning. So from an email perspective, the more you can get your external parties, vendors, companies that you do business with sending you documents, get them in an email format. And specifically what I mean by that is the industry standard, which is a PDF type file. So uh, at this point, let me turn it over to Eric and have you go through and kind of do the process part of this. And again, this is kind of our building blocks of what we model our products after. Eric? Thanks, Dean. Okay, so uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna kind of focus on the uh, AI and the, the ML uh, component. And uh, so artificial intelligence, machine learning uh, can help immensely with document classification, uh, data extraction, and the verification components. Uh, these are two closely related technologies that work together within IDP. So the use of uh, machine learning or ML, which is essentially a subset of AI, and IDP can improve the accuracy of document classification and data extraction by enabling the system to learn from previous examples and to actually make predictions based on what it has learned. As a system processes more documents, it becomes better at recognizing those patterns and it can actually adopt, uh, adapt to new uh, documents and uh, formats and types. So overall, the use of AI and ML and IDP can significantly improve the efficiency and accuracy of document processing tasks. So in this graphic below, I'm gonna highlight the first four steps and elaborate a bit on how AI and ML bring automation to these components. And I'm gonna hand it back over to Dean here in a minute or so. So starting with capture, uh, with our configurations, typically uh, we set up multiple means of, of capture uh, which would include email import, network watch folders, scan to folder from a network multifunction device, and even our API. So moving to classify. So once the documents arrive, regardless of the capture me method, um, IDP actually begins its recognition process leveraging AI and ML to classify the document that's act that it's reading. So then it, uh, once it's done that, it then, uh, once it's classified the document, it then extracts the relevant text from that document and it associates it with the appropriate fields. For example, uh, an invoice number or vendor name or ship to address. And then uh, after the extraction component, uh, verify. So after applying that extraction information into the correct fields, our IDP offering will then perform some QC checks for you, such as confidence threshold flagging of the data that it just read. Uh, for example, was it an A or a B? Um, so those types of things. And then we actually configure IDP to then perform some math calculations, such as adding the invoice lines uh, that, that it extracted from the document to the subtotal to make sure that the vendor's actually totaled up your invoice correctly. 
uh, believe it or not, we've, we've actually, we've had some customers who discovered uh, some of their vendors were rounding uh, uh, the dollars up uh, pretty significantly and IDP was quickly able to identify that and they were able to go back to their vendors and, and get some money back. So, um, so that, was, that was a big plus. <clears throat> so now uh, to, to cover the export um, and integrated components, I'm gonna hand it back over to Dean. Sure, thanks, Eric. Mm -hmm. So one of the things about the building blocks in this technology is flexibility. And flexibility on this case, when you look at the export and the integrated labels here, we really have multiple outputs from this technology from our RDP solution. So the first is exporting the information. What information? Well, the images and also the metadata. And the metadata obviously is the value here also. So we support industry standard formats to be able to export those to any type of line of business application that can accept those industry standard formats and then let those business applications go off and data mine and utilize that information. At the same time, from an integrated perspective, this particular module can also pass all this information over to Epicor Docstar Solutions. And of course, Docstar Solutions, and I'll touch on this next on my next slide, uh, can then therefore integrate back into other business applications where it makes sense to control workflows, validation, things like that. So what I'd like to do is let me jump to the next slide here and let's talk about uh, some of the benefits that our customers have realized. So I just have a short story here and this particular story is, you know, actually one of our most common uh, use cases, which is accounts payable. You know, Ralph and the others had mentioned it before about AP and that's been started some years ago, but you know, accounts payable is still a big value benefit for the IDP type technologies. So what I'd like to do is just, just talk about a few customer success metrics. In this case, a, a good customer of ours here in uh, Northern California, Coast County's Peterbilt. So Coast County's is a heavy duty truck dealership. So let's, let's talk about their challenges. So inefficient paper-based AP automation system. So they've all been working with paper for years. They've been processing, in this case, they started out when we engaged with them, about 2,500 invoices per month. They really lacked central visibility with this. They have about 10 different locations. And Eric mentioned before about staff being tied to mundane tasks. Well, these were expensive tasks. These were accountants that are actually tasked with doing this processing and manual data entry also. So in our case, our solution was a combination of, well, what's the combination? Well, Docstar has its own IDP type technology that's actually sold separately. We call it intelligent data capture. And along with that, we provide and offer an ECM, an enterprise content management system. So this particular customer combined both of these. Our ECM system was also further integrated into their ERP system for the heavy duty truck industry. So interesting thing on the benefits. So reduce the data entry workload by 90%. That's a pretty high yield. Now our IDB technologies with the intelligence that's built in them uh, and focused in this case for accounts payable invoicing, usually out of the box, we can start off in a 70 to 75% uh, recognition range, which is pretty good. And then there is some basic human interaction to help guide that learning engine further. Now, in this case too, they had about, I think, six AP staff when we met and started with them. So they repurposed 50% of that staff. While over the time period also, their volume increased by about 25%. So in this case, the key word here is repurposed. They're able to use these employees for other staff within the organization. Now, they also reduced their filing and retrieval time by 90%. Well, basically they've moved from paper assets to electronic information assets. They've also put all those documents online in our Docstar ECM repository, makes it much more uh, affordable and efficient to be able to recognize and retrieve that information. And in this case about paper usage, well, their usage has dropped about 80%. Uh, you know, customers store paper on site, they store off site, but these type of dealerships, they have warehouses, so they try to store 
on site with that, but they don't have a lot of disaster recovery and backup. And let me just make one more comment about this. So the example I picked here was about 2,500 invoices a month. So to give you an idea, we'll see customers that can see benefits starting out at even 500 invoices a month. We have customers, by the way, that do millions of documents a year through our process. So at this point, what I'd like to do based on our time is I'd like to hand this back over to Eric and let you talk a little bit more about other document capture use cases, Eric. Yep, thanks, Dean. Uh, so I know we're, we're getting kind of short on time. So uh, there, are, there are several, uh, but I would say the most common that I see day in and day out um, are primarily uh, related to accounting. So uh, inbound vendor invoices, customer POs, uh, those are really transactional type processes. So, you know, when you're considering applying this technology for those, I would say it's really prudent to evaluate the technology against what it currently costs you to process, let's say, a single invoice, as an example. Um, our research shows that you generally can save anywhere from a few dollars to over $10 per invoice. So the data uh, that Dean presented from an actual case study a few minutes ago is really a good testament to that viewpoint. Human resources is another pretty popular one. Um, onboarding documentation, personnel status change forms, uh, those are pretty popular. Uh, in manufacturing, uh, certificates of compliance, uh, bills of lading, PODs, um, manufacturing and distribution firms can, can really deal with super high volume in this area. So leveraging IDP here can certainly save a ton of time and money. And then finally, uh, though not quite as popular uh, as the other use cases, uh, contracts. So ID technology can help capture contract information uh, to feed into a relevant workflow or capture appropriate info to facilitate such items as expiration dates, uh, review dates, specific terms and conditions and, and, and things of that nature. So. Uh, I, I think we're close to the end. So Dean, bring us home. Sure, absolutely. So, uh, you know, a little bit about us. So Docstar as a technology has been around over 27 years. Uh, we are actually a product line under Epicor Software Corporation, which is a major market ERP company. And, you know, if you, if you got the idea from our uh, case study just a few minutes ago, we are both an IDP technology company and an enterprise content. So you have the best worlds of both technologies to utilize with us. And for us, we've been out there for, as I said, some years and well over 2,000 companies out on the market. So as, I, as we wrap up with this slide, I will mention that there are some of the samples that we're going to provide you. We're going to provide you that level uh, research document that we've summarized in the original slides. And also we're gonna provide you a link to the Coast County's customer success story. And that link, by the way, gives you access on our website to over 50 more stories. So at this point, uh, Kevin, let me turn it back over to you. I uh, wanted to see, do we have uh, a short couple of minutes for any questions? Very good, that is Dean Hillary and Eric McCracken at Docstar. Thank you, Dean and Eric. We do have time for just a question or two. This one coming in from Madhu, what is the correlation between Cofax, Docstar, and InfoSource? Is it that Docstar provides an IDP solution on top of Cofax capture? What do you have to say to that question? Yep, uh, Dean, I don't mind taking that. Um, sure. So basically where Docstar fits in the marketplace is uh, Docstar, is, as I kind of mentioned at the beginning of the, the presentation, we kind of fit in that purple bubble. Um, so we, we incorporate uh, our own uh, IDP technology within our, our solution, uh, which would be, uh, I would call it kind of comparable to the COFAX offering. And then we also have uh, enterprise content management capabilities. So uh, we can, we can, we're sort of an end to end from capture all the way through um, you know, uh, the storage and retrieval of your documents. So that's that's kind of where Docstar plays. And this question coming in from Nil, and thank you everyone for your questions and comments today. Please keep them coming. For, uh, this one from Nil, how do you see, or how, uh, 
how can we leverage IDP to read and conceptualize resumes from in varied formats for uh, a better fit in, in, I guess, in terms of human resource uh, management? Yeah, uh, good question. I don't know, Dean, do you want to take it or do you want, want me to? I can down? see how that could be a challenge since resumes mm -hmm. come in in any kind of formats in all kinds of ways. Um, what's the best practice there? I'm going to make a comment about that. So, so I think the IDP technology is still growing as far as trying to look at a totally unstructured document and pull that information. Let me make a comment about what, what we try to do today with that. So we'll use an IDP technology to try to grab some key pieces of information if we can in order to categorize and store the document in our ECM system. And then what we do from there is we have embedded OCR technology in our ECM system that we can apply across every machine printed word on every page of every document. So therefore we can now provide you the Google search. So if you're trying to look through a resume okay. and say, well, I need someone with, uh, you know, Microsoft Dynamics uh, experience, I can find that throughout the system. Okay. So, so today we All take right. a combined approach. Very good. That is Dean Hillary and Eric McCracken from Docstar. Thank you, Dean. Thank you, Eric, for being part of our event today. Yeah. Thanks for Thank having you, everybody. us. We appreciate it. All right. Moving right along, let's move on to our next guest, Robert Brown. Uh, Robert, are you with us? Hello. I am. Oh, Robert. Hello, Kevin. Are you hearing me? I am hearing you. I am seeing you, Robert. Thank you so Hello. much. Robert Brown is a senior manager, project quality and Assurance and support with Papyrus Software. Thank you, Robert. Robert is here talking about automating document centric tasks to unblock business value. That's what we're here about today. Robert, tell us more. Thanks, Kevin, um, for a very generous introduction. Um, hello, everyone. My name's Rob. Uh, I hope you can see my slides. Um, that's me, probably saying something very profound, I hope. Um, Today, I'm going to try to talk to you a little bit about unlocking business value and doing that through automation on these document centric tasks. So we've heard quite a lot already, some great uh, info from, from Ralph and Petra and also the guys from, from Docstar. I'm going to try to focus on um, a specific use case. I'm coming from, um, I said Papyrus, so we're offering, of course, inbound capture. We're dealing with outbound communication. We're dealing with process and storage of all that content in the middle there. Um, but today we're going to focus on capture. And my role is uh, boots on the ground. Um, I'm a, uh, I support our customer in the configuration, uh, application design, um, uh, high availability, performance, best practice, uh, uh, those type of ideas that we work together with our customers during the implementation phase of, the, of our projects together. Um, so that's where I'm most comfortable, and uh, that's where we'll be talking a little bit today. Um, and usually when I'm on these projects, of course, you know, we're hearing a lot about the heavy lifting in the background and these really clever engines uh, uh, doing clever things to extract content and data and categorize. But usually that's not what people are talking to me about. Usually they're saying, Rob, we've got a problem. We've got loads of content, and it's in this system and it's in this system. And now people want to send us stuff, you know, not just in the post or an email, but they want to upload it from our website or they're even uploading stuff on our Twitter account. So really that was a case for, uh, for, for one insurance company. Um, so that's the challenges, you know, that, that our customers are, are seeing and that's what they're looking to have solved. Um, and these people are part of the business teams, of course. So. These business teams are, of course, looking to drive optimization. Um, yeah, that's a gimme, Rob. You might as well say cut costs there. But it's not just about cutting costs. It's often about reducing that those times, those SLA times, those processing times. Uh, and as we heard earlier, I, I, I like the, 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 the comment that, um, that a lot of these people are employed to do something with a much higher skill level you know they're highly skilled people but they often end up doing a lot of manual processing um which is becoming a big challenge in in these departments 
And uh, of course, I'm not just talking to the business there. I take off my tie and I roll up my sleeves and I go and talk to our friends in, in IT. And that IT resource uh, availability or, or that shortage that we've seen over the last few years is a major challenge there. Uh, and if these guys are in charge of all of that integration and all of those systems around onboarding new lines of business and taking their documents and extracting and defining their extraction definitions in IT, you know, you're just going to end up with that big backlog. So trying to empower the business. From there, the challenge is that the, the looks like we're having some difficulty with Robert. Uh, Robert, you're freezing up. Are you still with us? Hello, Robert. Something about them. Um, and they're in the, the insurance okay, it looks business. Looks like Robert doing, is uh, back with us now. I'm sorry, Robert, you were freezing uh, up. We lost you there for a while. We were worried that we sorry, had lost uh, you forever. I, th uh, I thought oh. maybe, can you hear me again now? Uh, we can hear you. Okay. All right, I'll maybe on, that will help. Let's I'll continue on. Video. Yeah, sorry about All that. Right. Um, I hope I didn't say anything too clever during the time you couldn't hear me. Um, yeah, so. So just to pick that up, so I'd like to focus on, on a case study. So that's one of our customers that we work very closely with. Um, recently, that's Trig Vesta. They're an insurance provider operating in uh, Scandinavia. They're doing quite a decent bit of business, so $3.4 billion um, turnover per year. Um, and, you know, their strategy is the same that everyone else seems to have at the moment. They've got a lot of lines of business, they've got a lot of communication they need to send out to their customers, but they need to be able to deal with that communication coming in. And they also need to do business to business communication. And there's a lot of manual work going on at the moment, far too much, to be honest. Um, so they're really trying to solve that, that, that problem that, you know, they've got all these documents, um, out to their customers okay kevin here again it looks like we are losing robert um due to looks like it, there's some bad internet connection uh, um robert are you still with us yeah robert can brown you are you with us we are, we are losing you my friend can you hear me now kevin there i can we can hear you now oh, i'm terribly right. sorry about that don't know what's going on. All right, let's soldier on and see if we can't get lucky. All right. <laughs> How about that, Kevin? Take Is that away. any better? All right. Maybe a bit better. Is that better now? Let's try that. Okay. Okay, that's unfortunate timing. Um, I hope you can hear me, but please just just jump in again if um, if not. Yes, we can. Thank you, Robert. Good. So... Um, oh, I'm burning through my time now. What I was trying to get to was that our customers, of course, uh, they're trying to send out this content to their end consumers, and those end consumers need to be able to send back that information. So that's really what we've been what we've been looking at. And they want this magic box. They want this black box in the middle that's going to do all this clever uh, um, uh, lifting and heavy lifting and clever thinking for them. And in this case, what Trigger dealing with is mostly emails. They've got people doing, um, uh, having holiday insurance, home insurance, car insurance, and they're sending in, you know, dozens of documents. They're sending in uh, their claim document. They're sending in 
doctor a, a handwritten note a handwritten note they're sending in bills from the hospital they're sending in pictures from their car damage and they're all coming in in these emails and they've got people there some poor people that have to stare and compare All right, it looks like we have lost Robert, perhaps for good this time, Nina. Uh, perhaps it might be best if we moved That's on to our next that. presenter today. What do you think, Nina? Please hand, stand by, everyone. We're working through some of the technical issues in the background with Robert to see if we can't work through it. Waiting for our... Uh, some of the gnomes in the background to give me some direction on how we'd like to move forward. Are you with me? Um, Kevin, can you hear me again? You are back, Robert. We are concerned that we are losing you and perhaps for good. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Can we try, can we try one more time? Let's keep going and see what happens. If we lose you again, Robert, we may indeed, though, need to move on. Understood. Understood. All right. Um, I've shifted around. I really hope that that, uh, uh, that solves the problem. Okay. All right. Let's hope so. Okay. Sorry about that, everyone. So let me just try that again. So this is our case study with TRIG, and um, we're trying to remove the heavy lifting being done by these people, by these workers who are having to review all these different emails and they're having to manually then upload them into their claims processing system. So what Papyrus are doing then in that case is we are connecting directly to their email solution. So all those incoming attachments, their written letters, their images, their PDFs, we're picking those up with Papyrus and we're doing what we saw earlier, right? We're doing that classification. Uh, we're extracting those emails. And we're even going down several layers in the attachments. So you've got an email with a zip file and another email with multiple attachments included in there. Um, and once we've extracted that data, we want to validate that data. So we're pulling out the claim information. We're pulling out the uh, uh, amounts that have been at the bottom of the bills, for example, coming from the doctor's surgery. And we're validating that with what they have already in Guidewire. So we have an API, which is uploading that information, cross-checking and making sure that we've extracted what we needed to. Once we're good to go, um, we can then begin to archive that data. That can be archived in Papyrus. Um, in this case, this has been archived in, in their system. That's archived in Content Manager and in Guidewire. And we're delivering that back to Guidewire for those claim processing people to deal with. So the workflow itself is pretty straightforward. Yeah, We're not reinventing the wheel. It's not like they've got tens of thousands of different document types there. You know, Each department's probably got about um, 10 or 15 different document types, but they immediately saw uh, this huge return on investment. So they're going down, they're removing sort of 90%, 95% uh, uh, of the manual work being done there, and they're getting a pretty decent extraction rate off the bat. So this was after the pilot stage, this is much higher now actually, but they were getting 80% immediately. And I'm sure some people saying, hey, 80%, we can beat that immediately, Rob. Um, actually, one of the challenges there is you never really know what you're gonna get in those emails. So often people are forgetting to put in primary um, uh, information, critical information like a claim number or their customer ID. So those things would be hard to match even by a person, but they're increasing those as well as they go on. And what Trig was seeing then immediately was that um, those people, you know, they're not firing all those guys and saying, oh, brilliant, we can fire like 10 people who are monitoring those inboxes. Um, what they've managed to do is actually free them up to do more claims processing. So their SLAs have really shortened uh, and their um, return of investment has been really quick. 
And what they're seeing actually is that all these other lines of businesses are wanting to jump on the platform as well. So together with them, we did the first two lines of business and said, okay, look, there you go, there's your system, we're off. Um, and they are now working on onboarding uh, another 25 lines of business. It takes them about a day, two days to onboard um, a new one. Uh, they're just creating those extraction definitions and off they go. So that was how we approach it at, um, at Trig. Behind the scenes, of course, we've got the papyrus capture component. So we have uh, a very strong focus on integration. We've got all these different uh, uh, adapters and interface technologies available. Once we're bringing that content in, we don't really care from what source it's coming. We're gonna run those same classification definitions. We've got those learning algorithms in there as well. Once we've classified what type of document we've got, we're gonna look at extracting that metadata, that index information uh, and the content itself. And usually you want to validate, you may even want to enrich the data there as well. So maybe you're checking that it's correct and you might even pull some more information perhaps from a, from a CRM system. Once you're good to go, you can verify that with a person as well if you haven't hit your thresholds, your acceptance ratios, and then you want to distribute. And this is where things get interesting is that distribution and, and the delivery of that content and that metadata to the other surrounding systems, which enables you know, those businesses really to uh, start to, to, to get some value out of that solution. I mentioned interfaces uh, several times, you know, I'm not gonna start listing them primarily because I'm probably running uh, out of time now a little bit, um, but it's super important to get that integration right. It's great that you've got the technology, so you need all those different bits of tech from REST to all the email uh, adapters, et cetera. But you need to know what you're gonna do with that. It's important to understand um, what you're receiving. So what are these things? What am I expected to do with them? What do you want out of it? And how do I deliver that? Who do I deliver that to? And in what form do you want the metadata? Uh, do you want the content? Do you want that combined together? How are you going to use that um, to, to empower your business and reduce them the amount of manual time they need to uh, manage those documents? Um, and the types of documents, you know, this varies. We saw this earlier on. Um, but you really don't want to have to distinguish too much between those different types of documents. The critical thing is that for each of them, you've got a methodology, whether it's a free form extraction, fixed form, anchor points, uh, however you're picking up that information, that, that should be available and that should be configurable within your tool. And that's something, again, we, there's a big shift as we saw also from, from Patch earlier that, we're trying to reduce that load on, on, on IT. So you need to have those tools available in the business that they can do that themselves. So that supervised training is in, as important, maybe more important sometimes than the machine learning as those brains, you know, they're probably the most powerful machines that you've got. And they're the people that can see that there's an issue, you know, with the extraction or they know exactly where that uh, uh, content needs to come from. So you can improve over time and uh, as someone checking those documents, they verify, they say, oops, you've missed that piece of information. You highlight where that is and boom, you train the system. And next time that thing comes in, then it's gonna pick it up. And that's without a very complex change and release management process behind it. Um, and we're thinking about automating, you know, of course, in the background and doing all this heavy lifting and machine learning, but you also want to start to automate, you know, those uh, um, processes at the beginning. So when you're defining your different document types, Again, if there's a machine that can do some clever stuff for you, then why not get them to do it and uh, make you do all the thinking? So in this case, we're defining our classification definition. So I've just got a, a bunch of samples here that I'm just dragging and dropping into our UI. And I'm going to tell the system, look, they're all a similar type of document. Classify them, define my classification. So that's going to look up at things like the different keywords which are recurring over those different samples. It's going to look at things like um, the different layouts of margins, um, how many pages you've got. And once you've defined that, you can test any new sample. 
And this definition, definition can also auto update. So as you're getting new content in, uh, you can say to the system, hey, if you're sure, that's the same. If you're 90% sure, brilliant. Let that through and classify that as that type of document. If you're less than 90% sure, send that to me in my inbox. I'm going to check that for you and give it the OK, or we're going to make uh, an extension to that definition. In the background, of course, you need that heavy lifting workflow. So that's what we've been talking about before. I'm not going to try and explain every single queue we've got here, but I wanted to mention this as this is, you know, important that when you deploy that solution for the first time, that it's scalable. You know, you may be onboarding a tiny little department uh, with, you know, 15 documents a day, but once that thing takes off, you're going to need to be able to scale that. So you need a system which can auto scale and is going to use all the, the, the hardware resources that it needs to expand into the future. Um, and on the other side, we need to ensure that we remain in control of that expansion and we may remain in control of what's in the system. So you need that overview for your reporting and your dashboards that says, hey, Rob, I received 3,000 documents that came in. I uh, extracted 2,800. There's 200, uh, 100 still in process, and there's 100 that um, uh, uh, need some attention there as well. So you need that overview and that reporting to get some confidence that your system is doing what you're expecting it to do. Okay, I'm going to whiz through these last couple of slides um, because I, I know I'm uh, uh, certainly out of time now. We, but again, we do only have a couple of minutes left, Rob, just to, to make you aware of our time. Today. Thanks, Kevin. So we've just seen that process as well. What Papyrus are, are, are offering, of course, is the digital workplace as well. So this is where we can manage that content in Papyrus. If you're not managing it in your system, you can define process here. You can define collaboration. We can chat here as well. And the governance aspect can be defined here as well. So those content definitions for the retention periods, for example, super important to make sure you're only keeping the things that you need to keep. Last but not least, oh, I'm sweating a little bit now, as I'm definitely out of time. Um, the impact. Of course, that's a gimme, save costs. But the cost and efficiency, they just come immediately. You reduce that amount of manual labor and you increase those, uh, um, those uh, um, sorry, you increase your efficiency, you're reducing those SLAs, you're getting everything done a lot quicker. Uh, and you're scaling for the future as well. So when you deploy that application, you've got to ensure that that is good to go, not just for that first line of business, but for the next one and the next one and the next one, because this is going to be super popular once you deploy. How to get going, bite off something manageable. Take a, a little piece, try to find the bit that's hurting uh, the most. Uh, take that off. It could be the you know, it could be the amount of people, it could be the IT involvement, and just target that, make a small project out of that, a POC to prove that you've got those automation rates you're expecting, uh, and away you go. That's something that we do day in, day out at Papyrus, and that's something that we did with uh, Trig last year. Um, so I'm sorry about the interruptions there. Um, that was a, a bit of a problem, but thanks very much for your time. And Kevin, I'll, I'll hand back over to you. All right, that is Robert Brown, Senior Manager with Papyrus Software. Robert, thank you so much for being a part of our event today. Thanks for your time. Thanks everyone. All right, very good. Great discussions today. Great chats going on in the chats. Uh, great questions coming in. Thank you so much for that. Please keep it up. As we we move on to our next presenter today, David Santongo from Kofax. David, are you with us? I am, I am. Hello, David, coming in loud and clear. David Santongo is a product strategist with Kofax. David is here to talk to us about how to discover how IDP enables superior process automation. So David, tell us more. Absolutely, yeah, let me go ahead and get my slides up and running. Uh, and we'll get the show on the road. So thank you for the introduction. Uh, I am a product strategist at, at Kofax, and my remit is to think day in and day out about how to create better product market fit for our offerings, right? And that's how we support our customers. That's how we're able to grow together. Uh, and so I'm so excited about where I sit in the business and the opportunity it affords me to do these things. 
In terms of our, our journey today, there's a couple of things I want to head off on with you guys. And one is just quickly resetting on or, or revisiting the opportunity that Petra and others positioned up front. Um, and then we'll just quickly get into high impact use cases, right? Like how are we seeing our customers being successful? Hopefully that spurs um, some thoughts about where you all can look to deploy automation. And then we'll get into like the capabilities that are required to win. And you'll see what's like a synthesis of a lot of the different threads you've heard earlier today. I'll illuminate some customer success stories. And so you'll, you'll see some of where we're generating success for our customers around the world. And then we'll take you home in terms of how you can uh, some, take some action. The next steps will be pretty easy and hopefully it leaves uh, you feeling like you got something out of the, the time that you're, you're spending here. But this is where I want to kick us off. And there is a, a tremendous opportunity right ahead of us right now. Um, and that's really around combining digital technology and people in order to realize some multiples in terms of productivity that we haven't seen before. And I think up until this point, it's been largely theoretical, right? But to 2022, last year, um, really marked a moment where we started to see more technologies become mainstream, especially as a vehicle to extend people, right? This is not displacement, this is extending people. And I think the opportunity will also start to create a gap between those who are bringing in digital capability and scaling automation in a smart way and creating a gap from those who are just sticking to the traditional ways of doing things. And this gap will actually have consequences as it relates to ability to serve customers, right? <clears throat> and keeping our employees like stimulated in a new era of work and, and productivity. And so off to the right, you can begin to see like some of the macro tailwinds that are shaping this, right? A four and a half or 4.5 X growth in the volume of data that you're dealing with. And I know many of you here are probably feeling that. Um, and, and also 69% just an increase in digital transformation spend. And this uh, increase in also citizen developers who are playing a much larger role in building these solutions, right? Platforms just have to be intuitive in order to get that wide scale adoption. And this brings us to the focus of today's event. Um, and I believe this is still a major challenge up front. I mean, even capabilities like ChatGPT have issues when data upfront is very unstructured. So having a mechanism to structure that, i.e. one of the IDP value propositions is very valuable, more so today than ever before. And look, I'll just, <clears throat> just jump right into the data and, and quantitatives. Uh, an SSO1 study that we looked at um, puts uh, some numbers behind this, you know, almost 50% of the organizations they surveyed estimated that half their data is structured. And honestly, we're not seeing something too different in our customer base. Like they're coming to us and saying similar things. On the far right, we see that 86% said that unstructured data is causing operational challenges and efficiencies within their business. And just from a personal standpoint, before coming to Cofax, I worked at Deloitte and I was part of their RPA innovation practice, implementing RPA and I'm telling you all, like one of the things that caused the robots to break every time and prevented us from really scaling, made, it, made scale difficult is this unstructured data issue. And so having a platform that deals with this is I think the first step in order to realizing lasting transformation. So when we talk about unstructured data, um, I wanna make things just more practical, right? And so being able to automate against a lot of the use cases that you're seeing here is what we're hearing from our customers around the world. And Eric referenced some of this earlier, Robert referenced some of this earlier, Petro talked about this, but here are a lot of the use cases that we're seeing at the forefront. And loan application processing, for example, involves getting inputs from a customer. Some of them may be uh, unstructured, you know, application letters, proof of address, their ID, all that needs to be brought in all that needs to be done over and coordinated with a workflow that gets people through the necessary approvals to deliver that outcome back to the customer. Um, and similarly for common applications like bank statement processing, employer contractor onboarding, you know, we're seeing this happen over or this pattern over and over again. And to that end, we actually did a survey of our 25,000 customers around the world. 
Um, and we engaged on several things in, in terms of their technology priorities, in terms of the use cases they're focused on. And so you can see quantitatively, like a lot of these use cases bubble up towards the top. And I bring these forward to say that these are proven and lower risk places to get started. And part of this journey we understand is in setting yourself up for success, right? Like creating that business case and automating against the business problem where you can rest upon the successes of others and then position yourself for those quick wins that essentially create an opportunity to invest more. And I think in focusing on these areas, you can really balance uh, the approach in terms of automating things that drive impact and risk mitigation that positions your program for greater scale in your businesses. So now I wanna drill into like the capability suite. So if you think about like the suite of capabilities that it takes in order to build yourself up for that initial success, at, at Copax, this is what we think that it looks like. And, and in the market, this is where you'll start to see that there are many players that are really good across adjacent portions of this circle and you're solving elements of this problem. But we believe there's value that's really inherent in essentially bringing all this together in as intuitive uh, a way as possible, right? Without a lot of bespoke integration. And actually, if there's like one thing, just one thing you take away from my presentation, it's really just using this slide as an anchor, right? To assess any technology player that you're considering in the market and their ability to cover, provide that coverage across this scale, I think is across this trade is uh, important for you in terms of reaching scale. And I'll just go through like a couple of the, the capabilities here um, from a, multi-channel intake standpoint, ingesting data from any source, a lot of those use cases like loan processing, customer onboarding, you know, it's bringing in that data across multiple channels and others said it earlier, but it's not just documents and scanning. Like it is all these modern channels, including web, including mobile, including portals, including shared drives. There are all these places where data is coming from and the ability to seamlessly bring that into the platform, I think is really important. And then there's extracting and understanding the entities in that data. That's where we move to the second Chevron. Um, so that's the core classification, that's the core extraction, but going above and beyond out of the box extraction models are also really important. And you'll hear vendors talking about like document libraries in, in the market. And this is what it means, like providing out of the box models for invoices, out of the box models for things like IDs, payrolls, W2s. All of this is critical in asking those questions to ensure you're partnering with somebody who can provide you that value and provide it to you fast. And then layering into that insight is also critical. So there's extracting entities out of data, but there's also like generating the meaning out of it. And I'll give you an example. Our ability, <clears throat> we, so we have abilities where after we extract, you know, something from email threads, we can begin to layer in things like uh, NLP and sentiment analysis to understand like what is the telling of this email or to summarize it, right? Or to draw out the themes. And this has many implications that can lead to downstream actions, right? And that's where we, I'll, I'll take off my camera briefly, go into the action portion of this. And so the case management workflow and RPA that Petra was uh, talking about earlier, this is where that comes into the frame, being able to drive those downstream actions that are required in order to take um, or to develop an outcome based on what's happened earlier. So, all of this comes together into what we've decided to focus on as, as a company at Copex. So when you look at our journey, when you look at our roadmaps, you don't really have time to get into that detail today, but as we have follow-up conversations with some of you, you'll see that everything, our heart is beating to basically this circle over here because we see an opportunity to drive that value by covering down on, on all the, on the chevrons. So if we, shift from core capability to customer case stories. Like I want to use Safeguard as an example to illuminate um, a customer who we worked with in order to take them on this journey. And there's some pretty impactful things that they're doing. So for those who are not aware, um, they are an auto insurance provider. They do roughly 300 million in revenue per year. And they process about 2 million contracts and thousands of auto claims per month. 
And so in our conversations with them initially, they made it really clear to us that the ability to respond, right, to customers fast and process those, those claims was critical. And just to, to dive into a little bit more detail, um, there are about like 14 claims documents that are associated with each claim. And they needed to review in excess of 86 data, uh, 86 data points, right, uh, for, for each customer. Um, and then this would go into like a downstream workflow and go through necessary approvals before we get, they would uh, be able to get back to the customer. And oh, by the way, some of their employees were sitting in the middle going to like external websites like the Kelly Blue Book and the National Automo Automobile um, Deal Association websites to pull down information that like supplemented these claims. It was a mess, it was difficult. I, and it, it would take sometimes multiple days to respond to a claim. And so the wheel on the previous slide was the basis for the journey that we took with Safeguard, right? Like, so we brought in the platform uh, to handle multi-channel ingest of all the different claims documents they were receiving across channels. They even have a mobile uh, capability that they brought in that we power. We were uh, able to automate extraction of all the entities uh, that were required. We brought in our RPA solution, which also integrates with the platform to pull and automate the checks to like the Blue Book website and other websites that they need to pull information from. And all this was orchestrated by our underlying platform. And so they were able to reduce the time it takes to process a claim by 75%. They drove the productivity of their team up by 30%. And they also recognized a 15% increase in customer satisfaction after they went live. And this is a story that we just he, like it just it's over and over and over again that we're seeing this play out right uh we have a state and local customer who we worked with to transform one of their loan decisioning processes and they saw their throughput increase by 233 acts time uh, 233 acts um while saving almost 800 million a year in, in calendar business calendar year business now we worked with a financial services institution to reduce their invoicing processing costs by almost 75%, right? We, part, we partnered with global retailers, legal services firms, so very diverse customer base. And I, I put this up not to beat our chest, but to show that like there are many customers who are being successful. You know, for those who wanna speak more, we could certainly provide greater detail as to these use cases. And, and these, essentially set up areas where you could take a look within your business and transform really practically putting IDP to work to make a business in your organization, make a difference, sorry, in your organization. Coming to the tail end here, um, I also want to eliminate some of the outside in feedback that we received from the analyst community, right? As it relates to our platform, um, as it relates to the capabilities that we offer in the IDP space. And you'll see, this is um, an intelligent document processing report that Everest, uh, one of the analyst firms put out. Uh, they do it every year. This is the 22, 20, uh, 2022 version of the report. And we're including a link to this, uh, to the full study and the takeaway materials from uh, this presentation. Um, just to provide again that outside in book and you, it, it provides a pretty fair assessment of us and also others in the space and can inform some of the decisions you're making concerning who you might partner with and how you set yourself up for success. And again, I'll say uh, for those who want to engage and have more conversations on LinkedIn around the study, I'm happy to do so. But at this point, after stepping through like the macro trends of some of the customers that we're supporting, I did want to use this opportunity to just eliminate like where we're focused as a company and our identity. You know, so we do have our roots in that core capture and transformation, but the story has expanded right over time. And so we're going to market really with a platform. And this is like the core IDP functionality that really addresses a lot of the different use cases that our customers are, are, are looking to automate against. And then we have solutions around FPA, right? Around invoice processing, around document governance and security productivity. So all this is the breadth of capability that we have to offer. Um, we have a very vibrant partner community and ecosystem as well that's surrounding uh, the platform as well. So like a lot of, this, it's a community, right? That's coming together and creating a lot of goodness for our customers um, around the world. 
I want to leave you with a couple things. And so we're getting close to our, our call to action here. And so here's just some things you should be cautious of, right? As you're having conversations with people uh, throughout the space. And these are things we hold ourselves accountable to as well, right? So one is just statistics without, uh, without context. And so we've seen um, others and some of the newer entrants start to, to position in this way. So you're, they talk about extraordinary results and the supporting explanations can be a little bit light in that regard. And so just encouraging people to ask those pressing and pointed questions whenever you see that. Also focusing only on selective capabilities. And again, that's where one takeaway like looking at that anchor wheel graphic from earlier is a good basis for asking those challenging questions to make sure that people are providing that comprehensive capability that you need in order to scale. Um, and then there's always the, the demo versus reality conundrum, right? Sometimes what's demo does not necessarily translate into what happens in production. And so making sure you draw that extension is, it, it, distinction is critical. Um, and obviously claims about everything being easy should be taken with a grain of salt. And then my last couple points here, the clear call to actions are, take some time to inventory your internal opportunity landscape, right? And, and see how some of your in-house technologies compare to the our capability graphic. That will illuminate where there may be some gaps. And then you can have a very focused conversation about bringing in technology to address those gaps. You know, one of the things that uh, I always say when I'm speaking with our customers is, we provide a comprehensive platform, but it's also very modular as well. So if your gap is only in a specific area, you, know, you can slide in just for that specific area and then scale, uh, scale out from there should, should it, uh, you need. But I think inventorying your internal opportunity landscape against that wheel is a great and easy first step. Um, and then aligning on those priority use cases, right? Based on established metrics, um, impact and ROI. And some of the takeaway materials that we'll be laying out, like you'll see uh, the use cases that our customers are going after. I've also included the detailed safeguard customer case study. So you can read through and really see the journey that they went on in order to transform their claims process. And then just talk to us. Uh, I mean, we'll work with you to establish a, a plan that minimizes, minimizes that risk right, of, of falling short um, while producing those quick wins that justify continued scale of, of your program. And here we are at the end. Uh, so really do appreciate the, the time of this group, your attention. I do have my contact information uh, over here as well. I have included several different links available via email, LinkedIn, whatever channel that you want to use, uh, but very excited about go for discussion with several of you. And at that point, Kevin, I think we can open up for some Q&A. All right. Very good. That is David Santongo from Kofax. David, thank you so much. We do have some questions and some comments coming in. I guess, David, I want to ask about the recognition and use of handwritten data, whether that be a signature or a comment, especially at scale. We haven't really talked about that today uh, very much, but it has been a topic of some chatting going on. Tell us briefly about some of the capabilities that COFAX brings to the table when it comes to handwritten data recognition. Yeah, and it's amazing to see how technology has progressed in, in this way, right? And we, we do have capabilities around handwriting recognition. We do have capabilities around um, digital consent e-signature. Uh, but I think it's also important to, in the same vein, have an honest discussion about like the quality of the data that's coming in, right? If you have very, very poor and almost unrecognizable handwriting to the human eye, there are going to be some challenges, right, in getting to adequate levels of uh, extract, like extraction without needing to go through um, exception workflows around that. So I, I find when I sit down with our sales teams and also with our customers, talking about that in the same vein is, is critical. But yes, from a technology standpoint, we do have capabilities to support um, handwriting extraction, and we do have uh, e-signature capabilities as well. This question coming in, under the hood, uh, most of these IDP vendors will use multi uh, machine learning models 
samples from open sources. Is that true? How can one differentiate uh, uh, in the market space between those providers that are using open source versus uh, closed source? Yeah, no, this is where, and I sincerely appreciate that question. Challenging your vendor is, is critical. I mean, these are things that they should be open about. You know, at Cofax, we have proprietary models. We've worked for a long time to secure several uh, patents, right, that <clears throat> represent the things that we leverage across various techniques. Uh, we've, uh, we're having difficulty again today with David freezing up. David, are you with us? Yes, give me a second. Ah, Hold on. There we go. You were frozen again. We're that. having gremlins in the system today. Yeah, I think I, I think I pushed it too hard, right? With the uh, you okay. <laughs> I mean all right. Well, David, no, I guess I'll, I, I just want to I just want to wrap up with perhaps this last question. Um, really it's about at scale. I think a lot of folks are kind of getting at what are the considerations that we should look for when looking at an IDP vendor, especially when we're looking at a process that's at scale? Are there specific capabilities and sort of benchmarks that we should be looking for? No, thank you for the question, Kevin. And, and that's why I would just go back to that one wheel in, in the presentation, like that when you're looking to operate at scale, maturity across all those capabilities from insight, uh, data interest to data insight to taking action, maturity across all those chevrons is what we believe will, uh, will prepare or put you in a position where you can operate at scale. You know, we could have a drill down discussion, happy to, to do that, but at a high level, like using that as the blueprint for evaluating mm -hmm. uh, providers in the market, I think is a great, uh, a great initial step. All right, very good. That is David Santongo with COFAX. David, thank you so much for being part of our event today. Yeah, thank you for having me. Appreciate it. All right. Very, very good. Let us move along tonight or today and this afternoon, as the case may be, to our last presenter, Jason Butler. Jason, are you with us? I am. Can you hear me? I can. We can hear you loud and clear. Jason, welcome aboard. Jason thank you. Jason Butler is the Vice President of Conversion Services for Access Corp. And Jason is here to talk with us about maximizing value of records and information with IDP. Jason, please tell us more. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Kevin, I appreciate you. Um, thanks for AIM as a whole. I thought today has been a phenomenal presentation as, whole, as a whole. Um, I hope what, I, what I've heard and what I hope you see out of our presentation today is a lot of this will be uh, validation of what you're hearing across all of the different vendors. And, and, we're gonna walk you through a case study that we've done with one of our clients today around how did we use the IDP um, you know, to better benefit our client and, and help them show what we can do with, with this new technology that's out there today. So um, with that, uh, I've been in the industry uh, pretty close to a decade now. I uh, got involved with my, with my last employer and then made the switch over here to Access not too long ago to really um, help drive our capabilities with our with all of our clients and see where we can take this and help out multiple clients in the future. So with that, we'll go ahead and dive in uh, to, to the presentation. Um, so when we were talking to the, this client of ours, um, they had an interesting scenario, right? When you're talking about scanning and capturing of, of records, when you see a number of boxes such as 75,000 and close to 150 million pages of content and you get a client saying, hey, what if we what if we want to scan all this? We don't know if we necessarily need all the data, but we know we need some of it. We don't know if we need all of it. Right. So we, we want to sit there because that price tag can be somewhere in the seven to eight figure range if you're not careful, <clears throat> if you want to scan it all. So we sat down and said, okay, we, we might have a better solution for you, right? Maybe you don't have to scan everything. And we really dove into a very specific use case with them to make sure that um, A, they were comfortable with what we were able to do and B, uh, show them the power of technology that's out there today. So, uh, so we started out small pilot. Um, we went in and said, okay, let's, let's not go too, too big, too fast. We want to make sure you're comfortable with this. 
So we decided to say, okay, out of that 70, 75,000 boxes, let's take 1,400. Let's take, a, let's take a much smaller subset of it, bring them into one of our facilities. We'll go ahead and look to see, instead of a manual classification of what is it, can we use um, the IDP to make sure that we can automatically classify the documents and tell you what's in these boxes with a strong confidence level and that way you don't have to scan 75,000 boxes overall. Maybe we can get you to scan, you know, get your number down to 20,000 or 30,000, whatever that number ends up being with them. So that was, uh, that's where we wanted to go. So here's some of the results of our pilot. Um, we had a couple of objectives, right? We wanted to, to figure out a viable method to automatically classify the boxes. We had uh, an AI process for metadata, looking at box images, capturing the data off the front of the boxes. And this is where it got a little bit fun of, uh, we just heard um, David from Kofax talking about handwriting. Some of these were handwritten labels. Some we had to, some were structured data, some, was, some were unstructured. So how do we utilize that data uh, with just a small set? And then we said, okay, here's, here's where we really, really wanna go and see the secondary objective of the stuff that's not easily classified that by, by the first piece, can we look at a new process that looks at multiple images, throw it through our, our machine learning and our AI processes to really dive into that data and how far can we get with that work? So we had two objectives with them uh, and that's, that's where they went. So if we look at that primary objective right off the bat, right? Um, it was very successful. Client was ecstatic with what we were able to provide them, right? Uh, we, we were able to get a confidence level of 99%. We partnered with them, made sure we were able to get that level. Um, and so we were really confident that the data we had, we could classify and we were able to classify 85% of their document, 85% uh, of those files right off the bat. So strong results, strong, strong uh, initial uh, results there for our client, right? And able to get that accuracy of approximately 91%. So we felt super strong about this one, right? Um, things that we, other things that we were able to, to look at, um, you know, utilizing the customer uh, data. So again, making sure that we partnered with this client and making sure that we understood what it was, we were able to increase our accuracy by 42%. So as we're going through this process, it's not just a one-off. You know, this is a situation where we know we have to continue to evolve with the clients. And that's something that we're seeing out there is, you know, you know, clients want to be be part of the process. They they want to get out there, they want to do what we need to get done. So we want to to help get them there. So by that and having them at the table with us we are able to increase 42% from just um, the first run of the data through our system to the second pass of the data, right? Um, you know, and we said here, this will continually help us train the system and improve our model. So first primary objective we hit, we, um, we really were successful and client loved it. Secondary objective was something we were looking to say, how can we do this better? How can we do it faster? And can we make it uh, more cost effective for our clients in there, right? So we were able to look at a different onboarding process of these boxes and said, okay, what if you we were able to take multiple pictures of the boxes and go and, and really look at them from that standpoint? And is there more data um, as you look at all sides of the box and even opening up the box lid to see if there's little bits of data off of the, the contents that are out there, right? So we were able to look at that piece. So we were able to get more data uh, and be able to really hone in on what they are. That way, if we had the data, we can find a better way to really process that data for them and get them the, uh, the matching and the classified of the documents there. Can we do it faster, right? Um, able to go quicker, you know, look at more pictures, be able to pick up that data, the structured data, um, you know, that just allows our models to get much more efficient over time, right? The more data that we have, and you've heard that all day today, the more data that's in the, in the modules and in, in your libraries, the better it is, right? And finally, can we do it cheaper, right? And by moving to this, you have less human hours of manual classification, right? So instead of manual classifying 75,000 boxes, can we really get that number down and shrink that process here? 
So this next slide is is really something that it it, it blew our minds and it blew away the, the clients' minds as well. So when we went through this process, you can see this is just a sample of, of what we're able to pull off, right? When we looked at the manifest coming in and what we're able to capture, you see the first four columns, we didn't have much data. We couldn't get much data off of what we were able to get from that standpoint. But by looking at our first goal of, of just a, a quick snapshot of the box, running through our models, partnering with the client, you can see we're able to get a little bit more data out of the, out of the process. So we were able to capture and be able to match what that client needed and where it was going and be pretty and be very successful in that. Now, when we took a couple extra pictures and really combined all those photos and looked at the OCR components of them and able to capture the data, you can see our far, our far column, how much more data we're able to get, right? So this allows us to help train our systems and train our modules out there so that they that the customer can be able to match. And we are able to do a lot more with that data and help them see that there's a good amount of stuff here and we can help you really hone in on your decision-making process. So in just a short amount of time, we can go from hardly any data to being able to see all of that data by looking at it and, and utilizing the intelligent data processing uh, capabilities out there today. So that's, this, is one of the, this is one of my big slides out there Go ahead and, and let's let's run it through because we can capture a lot of data in today's world for you. Um, so this is a little bit after just one week of training. Um, we we did one pass and a second pass through it. So if you look here, you know we always use a confidence and a match, right? How precise the models are running and, and where we go. So we ran this data through once, and you know. It's, it's very common and most people understand that once we get out there, you can really start to see um, the first pass, the model's not really ready for it, right? We gotta make sure we're training it and really going to town and, and helping those things um, to, to really understand what data is out there. So you can see that first patch, that first pass that we had out there, the customer provided the meta, metadata for us. They gave us some acronyms. We looked at a retention schedule. You know, we were okay, right? The, it wasn't a great success story after that first training. We were able to match about 32% of the of the files overall. If you look at 53% confidence of that 60% number that we were able to match, we were confident on 53% of it. So, you know, not not great. But when we ran it through again, right, and partnered with our with our customer and and held and had some more man, uh, metadata come in with it you can see at that second pass, our confidence level jumped significantly. It went from 53% confidence that we were doing this, we were being able to have a, a strong match to 99.2% confidence. Overall, then we were able to say we can match 85% of these of the boxes with uh, almost 100% confidence. Therefore, we could say 84% of those boxes, we are, are, we are super strong and understand that this is what's in that data. So if you wanted to know what, what that 75,000 boxes look like, I'm confident that 84% of it we can get through, right? And that's just after one pass. Think about after you run a third pass and a fourth pass, we're gonna get better and better and better. So you could really start to shrink down that full size number of boxes out there into a manageable set and help reduce those costs for our clients, right? Um, and as we continue, we look at the cost reductions that we saw, right? And these are just some numbers that we've seen uh, through this and looking at this and partnering with, with our clients out there. Typically, when we are on board a box, we're looking at um, it takes us just under half an hour to do a, a, a true um, a manual indexing of the box and, and getting that data out there. Uh, and based on our, our labor rates, that equals about $12, right? And going through this new method, going through fast and, and looking at what we have out there, you can see this takes us about 30 seconds to capture all this data through some new onboarding processes and going, going that way, taking us all the way down to when we look at the technology around $2 uh, a box to onboard. So right there, you can see that we have tremendous success being able to do it faster and cheaper for our clients and, and helping them out and get there and get to, to what they need. A couple of key takeaways that we had on here, we talked about handwritten uh, in the last uh, in the last presentation. Um, it's out there, guys. The you know it's 
it's coming along from where it was just a couple of years ago today. You know, we were we were very successful in handwriting and, and understanding the OCR capabilities and looking at those files and be able to take it in. Right, we were this pilot in particular. We were about eighty eight percent accurate on the handwriting on the handwritten files. So that technology is coming a very very long way, and it's super exciting to see going forward. Right, um, how do we you know the solution capture multiple images of the box just so you're you get more information. Right. Um, and then, you know, using our, our own systems for processing, routing, retention, keeping it all together gives the client a much more robust solution at the end of the day, uh, really benefiting them. And again, hitting all three factors of better, faster, cheaper for our clients to make a more informed and uh, decision on all of their records management needs out there. Uh, finally, some of the stuff that we learned uh, as part of this, you know, Partnership with our clients is key. Um, you got to make sure you partner with them. You got to make sure that uh, we're we're hand in hand. A lot of this is, is very tough on them. They they may not have the um, the departments in house to fully understand what it means from a, a document management pr uh, processing standpoint. The intelligent uh, processing aspect of it as well. How do you really work in with them, right? Um, we want to make sure we have a platform that supports a varying, a, a varying and advancing level of AI products out there, right? Um, and in our business, we see uh, customers and clients from all different spectrums out there. So we know we have to look at different document types, uh, how they're stored, what they're looking in, different mediums of records, um, different uh, customer requirements. Uh, that's in the other aspect out here is is data governance and, and making sure that we're applying all of the standards out there and, may, and helping our clients know what is out there and what is not and what can we do and where we're at, right? Um, you know, in the size of the data sets that we're coming out of a post-pandemic world, manual identification is, is tough, right? It, it, it's costly, it's time, it's time consuming, um, and there's a lot of pieces that go on out there. So manual identification probably not a great option out there for many customers and many of our clients today. Um, and again, I think this is something that you've seen all throughout the, the presentation of the day is the data, set, the data sets and the abilities out there, the, the different tool sets are constantly improving from where they were just two or three years ago to where they are today is night and day. Um, and especially see this in the handwritten uh, and handwriting capture abilities out there. Um, and finally, if we're going to continue our success, we have to embrace this model and we have to help our clients embrace the AI aspect out there so we can uh, benefit them and give them everything that they need um, to manage their records effectively and not just have boxes on paper and, and get data that they may or may not need. This is something that we can really pinpoint and hone in on and get them exactly what they need uh, for future success. With that, uh, my my contact info is on here. More than happy to to share and, and talk further with anybody out there. Uh, you know, we we do love our clients and, and think that we have a, a strong platform to go about in really using our robust our robust tool sets to to help everyone out there. So, Kevin, very good. That is Jason Butler with Access Corp. Jason, thank you for being with us. Some great studies. Some great. Uh... Um, empirical evidence that you have there. I was impressed. I want to ask about the adoption of AI tools. Um, you mentioned encouraging customers to come along that journey. What are some of the challenges that you've seen with your customers regarding the adoption of, of some of these AI tools? What were the problems and what should we do about them? Yeah, I think there's a few things, right? Um, lack of knowledge and expertise in the AI space. It's you know, I, I think someone made the comment at the very beginning around, you know, the movie Terminator scared everyone away, everyone away around machine learning uh, many years ago, but it's come so far and we need to be able to embrace these technologies, embrace the tool sets to get out there, right? Um, if a client doesn't have that knowledge, it doesn't have that expertise, we need to help make sure they understand what it is, walk them through the process. As we talked about, partner with our clients to make sure that their data is safe, their data is secure, and, and that we're using it to help them uh, out there in that space, right? Give them um, the abilities to, to be stronger and more informed about that decision out there. Um, 
you know, there are some legal considerations, right? I think data privacy is a, a massive concern out there in the, in the market today. Um, you know, you look at all the different data privacy laws, making sure that the data is, you know, following the retention uh, aspects of it, we're able to use it and not, um, and not interfere with what's out there from those perspectives today. So, you know, making sure that we can use our tool sets to, to use it in those fashions as well. And, and again, bringing the client away to make sure uh, along the journey to make sure that what we have is appropriate for them and their, and their data. So it's not going to impact their customer base as well. And um, finally, um, the cost and the return on investment. It, it's, you know, while we say it's better, faster, cheaper, when you look at it from an AI perspective, it's still um, a technology cost out there. And what are the true benefits that we're going to get? So we need to help them and show these case studies about, hey, do you really need all this data? You know, can we find a way to back it off and, and help you save that money and show you the benefits that it is that's going to be out there today? So that's uh, those are three of the big challenges that we, we have when we're talking to customers about this uh, data set. Jason, how complicated is it to swap AI and or the routing tools and the modules from a resource standpoint? What's the time and the money commitment if a new AI library is released and how intertwined is that AI element into the rest of the tech stack? Yeah, I think it, 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 this is a really interesting uh, question out there. So I appreciate it, Kevin. Um, you know, it varies. The, the the simple answer is it varies. And, and that's the challenge that we have with our, our clients. So, you know, the way the data is brought in and the modules that we use today, um, and the more data we run through and the, the simpler and the and the more straightforward the data is, then it's the models and modules as we introduce uh, different, slightly different documents, it can usually accept them pretty easily and, and pretty and pretty simplistic. But if you're introducing a module and some new data sets and metadata into it that is um, more complex, more challenging, the model may or may not um, hit the mark, right? And we have to make sure that, that we're seeing that happen from all of the different aspects out there um, and really partnering with the models and, and keeping them fine tuned, right? So there is a little bit of that human loop aspect that we have to maintain in there. Um, so it really depends on, on the varying sets. Now, with what we're trying to do at, at Access is, is create a, a very modular-based architecture where we can swap out different modules can, depending on the different scenarios. So we have the ability to, at runtime, switch out the modules to make it understand what data sets that we have and where they and where it best fits within these different libraries and, and such. So depending on where it comes and, and where and what the data looks like, we are utilizing this in such a way that um, we can flip the switch for our, our customers and our clients to, to help them benefit them in, in the right thing. So, um, you know, I, I think I'd end by saying it's, it's, um, it's definitely a varying structure type, but you do have to be careful in some of these changes to make sure that the, the benefits don't outweigh the cost, right? And um, really partnering together because if it, if it is a massive change in the document structure, there might be a different solution that we want to talk with uh, with our clients and not just assume it's going to be the same one, right? So again, it goes back to the the partnership with the clients out there to say, how does it look like? Where are they, where are they coming from? And analyzing the new data sets that are coming in to make sure it partners well with that. One of the applications that people often ask about, and we've had some questions here today, it's about uh, enabling a digital mail room. Tell us a little bit about the challenges and opportunities that you've seen with clients that are working to implement a digital mail room approach. Um, yeah, we have we have a few we have several clients that are on our digital mail room platform. Um, this is another one of these examples where being able to understand that mail that comes into <clears throat> into your site is, is key, right? Um, and using these types of techniques to, to analyze that data and, and put them in a spot where they don't have to manually route the files to each individual client that they see, there are benefits that we can even apply here in some of the in some of the data uh, the um, data processing tools, the intelligent data processing tools out there that will benefit them in that in those spaces as well, right? Of 
hey, this is a, you know, we, we see the different types of, um, of mail that's coming in. If we want to pick on insurance for a little bit and look at the different types of claims, you can say, okay, this is an easy standard claims document. And if anybody's in the insurance world, there's nothing ever in easy or standard about a claims document. Um, but we are able to put it through, learn the system, put it through our, um, our AI patterns and be able to, to spit out exactly where it needs to go, whether it's a homeowner's claim, auto claim, or, or in such of those matters. So, you know, there are some strong benefits to utilizing IDP in a digital mailroom situation. So you don't have to um, just manually route the mail anymore, right? And say, oh, it's this person. So you can really hone in specifically on what departments need to get what pieces of mail from a mailroom solution utilizing IDP going forward. All right. Very good. That is Jason Butler, Vice President of Conversion Services with Access Corp. Jason, thank you for being a part of our event today. Thank you. All right. Well, that will get us close to a close here tonight today for our event, really talking about intelligent document processing. Look, what makes it intelligent? Look, it, Pick any process with any business, and you can bet that there's at least one document that runs the workflow that facilitates that process. And many of those processes are critical to the, the furtherance of the business uh, mission, whatever we're about, whatever, it, whether we're insurance or government or manufacturing, it doesn't matter. Uh, you can bet that our processes are supported by documents, it, either in paper form, still in, in much in paper form, but also electronic documents as well. So this continuum between capturing data and applying processes and intelligence to document processing is really just a metaphor for really making sure that our, our, our processes are modern and most effective. And we've had some great speakers here talking about the different aspects to consider when putting our strategies together. So I really wanna thank everyone for their contributions today. And thank you also to everyone here in the audience for your contributions as well. So join us next time, but until then, I wanna pass it back over to Nina to tell us a little bit more. I know that we have uh, AIM 2023 coming up here shortly. Nina, tell us more. Sorry about that, Kevin. <laughs> it seems like we're all glitching today. Um, AIM 23 is headed to New Orleans and promises to be a conference unlike any other you've ever experienced. This year's theme is content in the flow of work. The AIM 2023 conference curriculum provides you with a comprehensive and proven methodology for mastering your organization's content to operate more effectively. Register now and you won't wanna miss it. I will be dropping that link in the chat shortly. And once again, um, just as we bring this webinar to a close, a few last minute reminders. We have recorded this webinar so you can catch anything you wanna hear again in a recap email that will be sent within 24 hours. Um, a link to the resources for this webinar was put in the chat. You'll find a copy of this presentation as well as additional resources through that link. Don't forget to take our feedback survey and let us know how we did. So a big thank you to our sponsors today, Access Corp, Docstar and Epicor Solution, Cofax, Papyrus, and contributions from InfoSource. Without support from our solutions providers and contributors, we won't be able to bring you these free educational programs. And I wanna say again, thank you everyone for joining us today. I know it's been a jam-packed session, but we hope to see you next time. This is Nina from AIM saying take care.